I'll be using John chapter 11 in just a moment as well as Revelation chapter 8. We'll be going back and forth between those two New Testament passages. So if you want to put one finger in one passage and one finger in the other, that'd be good. I don't know what to tell you if you use an iPhone. I don't know how you put one finger in one and, and one in the other. I'd like to tell you about someone. Uh, his name is not important. Uh, gender really is not in any concern. His title is irrelevant. He's, he's important not because of who he is, but because of what he did. He went to Jesus on behalf of a friend. Someone needed to go, and so someone went. Others cared for the sick man in other ways. They, they brought food. They brought encouragement. They encouraged his family. Each role was crucial. Each person was helpful. But none was more vital than the person who went to Jesus. He went because he was asked to go. Family members requested that he go to Jesus on behalf of the afflicted. Two sisters came to him and they said, We need someone to talk to Jesus on behalf of our sick brother. Will you go? And he went. The two sisters would have gone themselves, but they needed to stay close to Lazarus. They needed someone to go for them. Not just anyone, mind you. They needed someone who wouldn't give up on the way. Someone who knew the way. Someone who, like they, believed that Jesus had to know about the condition of their dying brother. And they wanted to make sure that someone would tell him. And he could. And so he did. Not everyone would go. This was no small request that the sisters were making. They needed a diligent ambassador. They needed somebody who knew how to find Jesus. Somebody who wouldn't give up mid-journey. Someone who would make sure that the message was delivered. They knew of a trustworthy person, and, and so they approached him. They issued their request. They entrusted the assignment to not just anyone, but to someone. John 11 and verse 3 gives reference to this someone. So Mar Mary and Martha sent who? Someone. Sent someone to tell Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Someone. Raise your hand if you're a someone. Congratulations, your name is in the Bible. Someone went. Someone went to tell Jesus about Lazarus, who was sick. Now, if you know the rest of the story, you may be tempted to go quickly into the consequence or the result of this prayer because it's so dramatic. Jesus, after a matter of days, comes and, and, and finds Lazarus has already been dead and buried for four days. And Lazarus, and Jesus speaks to Lazarus, though Lazarus is dead. And, and Lazarus comes walking out of the tomb. It's one of the most dramatic stories in the entire Bible. And maybe because of the drama at the end, we might miss the significance at the beginning. And that is, it all began when someone went to Jesus. How important was the role of someone in the healing of Lazarus? Some might say, well, Jesus certainly would have done something eventually. Granted, he surely would have. But John, who recorded this story, wants to make sure we know that the healing began when the prayer was offered. Look in verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said... This sickness will not end in death. It is for the glory of God to bring glory to the Son of God. When was Lazarus healed? Well, after the request was made. After Jesus heard the request. The healing wouldn't take place for several days. But the prayer might as well have already been answered. Because it was when the request was made. It's as if the timer was set. And all that was needed was the passage of time. Once the request was placed in the presence of Christ, everything changed. 
Would Jesus have responded the same way if the messenger had not have spoken? If no one had gone to him? What we know is this. The power of God was displayed when the prayer of the heart was offered. And a great miracle happened. Why? Because someone, raise your hand if you're a someone, because someone prayed. The Bible says that prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. How are we to pray? Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Our prayers trigger the actions of heaven. Can I say that again? Our prayers trigger the actions of heaven. Do you find that as hard to believe as I do? I have met people in my life who find prayer somewhat easy. They accept it with such faith. They're such prayer warriors, men and women of prayer. I've not been one of those people. I've been one of the people who would gladly roll up his sleeves and get to work, but bow my knees and spend time in prayer. It seems counterintuitive. God, don't you need me to do something? What is happening when I'm bowing my head and talking? Don't I need to be busy fixing, talking to purse to people or, or building something or going somewhere? But prayer seems so, what's the word? Passive. Inactive. I believe for that reason, I've had this lifelong fascination with prayer. Why? Why does God want to hear from us? And why are stories like this in the Bible? Why are there stories in the Bible that tell us that when we pray, God not only hears, but He responds? This lifelong fascination with prayer is more for my benefit than for the church. Because I need constant reminders to pray. If you don't need any reminders to pray, then you can just kind of tune out. But the rest of us, if we need to be reminded why prayer matters to God, I think we'll find the next four weeks to be very helpful. I've assembled some of my favorite passages on prayer. Some of the favorite stories like this one that I've ever seen in the Bible. Back in the early 90s as a church, we spent some ex exciting months, at least I felt, discovering prayer in which I felt like God gave to our church some important truths about prayer. We're going to go back and revisit some of those truths. If you were here back in the early 90s, number one, you're pretty old. Number two, you've got a good memory. <clears throat> I want to bring those memories back to the surface and I remember when we began that series on prayer we looked at this story in John chapter 8 and we all said okay I'm going to be the someone and I'm going to issue that invitation again would you be that someone who goes to Jesus on behalf of people in order to do that we must believe that something happens when we pray and I think that's why John tells us stories like this. And I believe that's why John tells us stories like he tells us in the book of Revelation. Now flip over to the book of Revelation. We're going to ultimately land in chapter 8. But let me just remind you of the setting of this curious book of Revelation. John begins <clears throat> chapter 1 and verse 10 by giving us the context. He says, on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard a loud voice behind me that sounded like a trumpet. On the Lord's day, John has been isolated from the church. He's been abandoned to the island of Patmos. 
Rome has done her damage on Peter. Rome, Rome has done her damage on Paul. And now Rome seeks to silence the tongue and the pen of John by placing him in exile on this small island, windswept, rock-covered island. From the perspective of Nero, this is the ultimate persecution. But from the perspective of heaven, this is the ultimate opportunity. Because God is going to reveal some teachings to John, not just about what is yet to come, but about what is happening right now in the heavenlies. It's as if God is going to pull the curtain back on heaven and give John, this aged apostle, an opportunity to look into the very throne room of God. He's probably 80 years old by now, at least 80, maybe older. And he remembers what happened that day. He says it was on the Lord's day. It was on the first day of the week. It's on the day that Jesus came out of the grave. John was there the first day Jesus came out of the grave outside of Jerusalem. He still remembers that day some six decades later. On the Lord's day, he says, I was in the Spirit. I was in communion with the Heavenly Father. I was engaged with Him. I was seeking Him. And I was aware that He was seeking me. We were walking together. On the Lord's day, He says, I was in the Spirit. And then look what He says. I heard a loud voice behind me that sounded like a trumpet. This revelation begins with what John hears. He hears a loud voice behind him. Oh, what was that? He heard a loud voice behind him. And how did that voice sound like? A trumpet. Have you ever heard a trumpet? Have you ever heard a loud voice? Have you ever heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet? I haven't either. <laughs> Welcome to the world of Revelation. Where our imaginations are stretched. Taken into places we've never seen. John says, I heard a voice. I think it sounded like a trumpet. And this is just the first of many sounds that he hears. As we turn quickly from Revelation 1 into chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, we realize he's talking a lot about sounds. He hears things. One sound after another. The sounds of angels who cry out, Holy, 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 nonstop. The sound of elders who worship. You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power because you made all things. The sound of martyrs who have already been taken into the heavens in their spirit. And they cry out over and over, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? And we get this impression that the throne room of heaven is full of sounds. Glorious sounds, probing sounds, moving sounds, thunderous sounds, inexplicable sounds. One sound after another. And then we turn the page on Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. And John says, and then there was what? Silence. In heaven. For about half an hour. Now if that passage doesn't cause you to scratch your head. I don't know what does. And then there was silence. There's been all this noise. This noise. This noise. These sounds. What, what John heard. He heard. He heard. But then all of a sudden. There was silence. A sudden stillness. As if, a, as if, the, as if the director of an orchestra stepped up. And he picked up the baton and the cacophony of, of warm-up all of a sudden comes to a sudden silence. And he lifts. And there's silence. I do not know why 30 minutes. I do not know. Isn't it curious? This reference to time for the first time and the last time. There is this reference to 30 minutes of silence. But for all we do not know about why this happened and how this happened, there is this explanation that intrigues those of us who are trying to understand prayer. 
When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to whom were given seven trumpets. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden pan for incense. He was given much incense to offer with all the, help me here, prayers of all God's holy people. The angel put this offering on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke from the incense went up from the angel's hand to God with the prayers of God's people. And then the angel filled the incense pan with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were flashes of lightning and thunder and loud noises and an earthquake. There is a moment in heaven in which every song ceases. There is a moment in heaven in which every sound stops. There is a time in heaven for 30 minutes, symbolic, literal, I do not know. But there is a time in which God lifts his hand and says, everyone be quiet. Shh. I hear something. And what does he hear? The prayers of God's holy people. Your prayers trump every sound in heaven. When you pray, God says, I want to hear this. And everything is quiet. And He listens. Tell me, who will listen to you for 30 minutes? Who? Will anyone? I mean, listen. I mean, without interrupting you. Without giving some well-meaning advice. Without dozing off. Who will listen to you for 30 minutes? Receive the message of this passage. God will. God will. And what's the qualification? You have to be someone. Raise your hand if you're someone. Congratulations. When you pray, your words trump every sound in heaven. The angels are told to be quiet. Put the trumpet away for just a minute. Elders, quiet. I want to hear what someone says. Because when you pray, that triggers the response of heaven. God wants to hear your heart. God wants to hear your heart. Why? Ultimately, he'll have to answer that one for us. But it has something to do with this affection that he has for you. When the friend of Mary and Martha went to talk to Jesus on behalf of Lazarus, here's what they said. Lord, the one you love is sick. Basically, someone, this ambassador, this messenger, was appealing to the love of Jesus. Because you love him, will you do something? He didn't appeal to the love that he had for Jesus. He didn't say, now, Jesus, because I love you, will you go help Lazarus? And he didn't say, Lord, because Lazarus loves you, will you go help him? What did he say? He said, Lord, because you love Lazarus, will you go help him? He appealed to the love of God. Why does prayer matter? It has something to do with the love that God has for his people. Since the beginning of time, he has cherished the moments in which he could walk with us in the gardens of Edens of the world, in the cool of the evening in which we could just be together with no shame, no embarrassment, no hindrance, in which we could just be together, in which we could just commune, in which everything would be quiet and we could be together. The one you love 
is sick. And so the power of that prayer depended not upon the one who offered the prayer, did it? But it depended just upon the one who heard the prayer, Jesus. And when Jesus hears the hearts of his children, he does something. Again, verse 4 of chapter 11, when Jesus heard this, the sickness, he said, this sickness will not end in death. He issued a promise, and his promise cannot be broken. When was the promise issued? It was issued after the prayer was offered. The sequence matters here. Sequence matters here. When someone offered the prayer, Jesus made a declaration. Days would pass before that promise would be fulfilled. But it doesn't matter when it was fulfilled. What matters is that it was made. And the promise was made after the prayer was offered. What's the point? When we pray, God makes declarations. He speaks. Our words prompt His words. Go figure. Our words prompt His response. The prayers of children on earth prompt actions in heaven. This is echoed again in the book of Revelation, what we just saw. The smoke from the incense, in verse 4 of chapter 8 of Revelation, the smoke from the incense went up from the angel's hand to God with the prayers of God's people. So listen, whenever you pray, those prayers go up, carried by angels, into the presence of God, where God hears those prayers. And once He hears those prayers, look what happens. The angel filled the incense with fire from the altar and threw it down on the earth. Follow the itinerary of your prayers. They begin here. They go into the throne room of God. He hears those prayers and turns those prayers into actions that come down on earth. Astounding. The most powerful tool in your life is this privilege of prayer. Because when you pray, God takes those prayers, turns them back into actions on earth. They come back into the actions of healings. They come back to the earth in the action of encouragement. They come back into the earth in the action of wisdom. They come back into the earth into the, in the form of, 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 of stronger marriages, stronger people, stronger church. I think it's interesting that never once in the New Testament did the disciples come to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to teach. But they did come to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Because they figured out that whenever Jesus prayed, something happened. And they wanted to pray in such a fashion that something happened. That's my prayer for our church. I'll confess to you, it's been the prayer of my heart for this church for these nearly 25 years that I've been here. What would happen if we really prayed? How different would San Antonio be? How different would our marriages be? What would it be like if our first response to tension in our home was not to lash out, but to bow our knees and pray? What if our marriages were cemented with prayer? What if our teenagers went into the high schools with a prayer on their lips and a worship in their heart every day of the week. What would that be like? Have we ever, has San Antonio ever seen a church captured by prayer? Oh, the priority, the privilege, the beauty, and the power of prayer. And the beauty is that who can pray? What's the qualification? Well, you have to be, are you us? Raise your hand if you're someone. Congratulations! Because someone prayed, a dead man walked out of the grave. Because someone prayed, a dead marriage came to life. Because someone prayed, a dead faith came to life. Because someone prayed, a dead future emerged into potential and power. Because someone prayed. Listen, you're not out of hope because you're not out of prayers. You're not out of hope. Jesus wants us to always pray so we never lose hope. So you may think you're out of hope, but you're not. Because you're not out of prayers. So how do we wrap this up? I think a couple of things. 
I think, first of all, we take God at His Word. We take God at His Word. And we defy any thought in the name of Jesus. We defy that thought that comes into our mind and says, you know, I'm not good enough to pray. I'm not righteous enough to pray. I'm not young enough to pray. I'm not good looking enough to pray. I'm not rich enough to pray. Whatever it is that might convince you, try to convince you that your prayers are anything less than what God wants to hear, you speak against that in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's not up to you to understand why God wants to hear you pray. All that matters to you is that God does. And your highest call, your highest call as a child of God is to intercede for the world. That job has been given to no one else except the church. I hope the government prays. But God didn't give prayer to the government. I hope education prays. I wish there were prayer in all our schools. But God didn't give prayer to the schools. I hope the military prays. I imagine everyone in the military does. But there's no passage that says that the assignment of the military is to pray. But there is, re- there is abundant scripture that reminds us that the highest call of God's people is to pray. Right? Let's be people of prayer. Someone prayed and let's believe that the second we offer a prayer something is set in motion that will end up in the form of an answered prayer now many of you right now are in between that offered prayer and that answered prayer that's okay just don't be anxious there just live like that prayer is going to be answered believe the heart of a good God because the power of the prayer doesn't depend upon you it depends upon the one who hears the prayer And so you, like someone, go to Jesus and say, Lord, the one whom you love has cancer. The one whom you love just lost his job. The one whom you love is struggling with her faith. Would you help? And then you can believe that you have done something in the heavens that's going to result in lightning and thunder and changes that are going to come out of heaven back down to the earth. Why? Why? Because someone prayed. Are you a someone? Then may God give you and me strength to pray. Heavenly Father, we offer this prayer in the hope that you would help us believe in this power, this goodness, this willingness on your heart to hear our prayers. We want to be people of prayer. We really do, Lord. We don't want to be people of anxiety. We don't want to be people of enmity. We want to be people who pray. And we volunteer, Lord, that you would teach us to commune with you in such a way that the world is better because we pray. Through Jesus, we offer this prayer. And all who agreed with it said,